4.1 for you today. This one is for the updated 2015 revisions, the most up-to-date Key Concept 4.1 video you will find before you begin. It is shout-out time. Couple shout-outs. One to Mr. Summers' class in Florida. Mr. Summers, I've received numerous comments to give your class a shout-out. Thank you for the support. I need to give a yo-yo-yo to Mr. Bannister's class and Mr. Barnes' class. A huge shout-out to you as well. Thank you all for the support. I appreciate it. If you want a shout-out, throw it in the comments, and I will get to it eventually, I promise. All right, let's take a look at Key Concept 4.1. It states the United States began to develop a modern democracy and celebrate a new national culture, while Americans sought to define the nation's democratic ideals and change their society and institutions to match them. Some, so some big idea questions you should be thinking about. What were the reasons for the development of political parties? Definitely know this. This to me screams a short answer question. If I'm the AP people and I'm not, but if I'm writing a short answer question for your test, I'm going right to this, the development of political parties and characteristics for each party. How did the second Great Awakening impact America? Yep, that's right. I said second, so we're going back to another Great Awakening. How did slaves adapt to their circumstances and create a new culture? All right, key concept 4.1. Roman number one says the nation's transition to a more participatory democracy was achieved by expanding suffrage from a system based on property ownership to one based on voting by all adult white men. And it was accompanied by the growth of political parties. So let's take a look at the first political parties that emerged. Now remember, what did Washington say about political parties? He was like, nah, man, don't form them. And as soon as he said that, they formed. So Federalists, this is the first party system. Federalists, they tended to favor a strong central government, hence the word Federalists. They, they were supported by the upper class, merchants and bankers as well. And they were pro-British. This was because of trade with Britain. Since a lot of them were merchants and they focused on improving the economy, they were pro-British for trading. And they also favored a loose interpretation of the Constitution. That is how Hamilton justified the Bank of the United States. He said, look, just because it's not in there, doesn't mean it can't be done. On the other end, we have the Democratic Republicans, also known as the Jeffersonians. They were more states' rights oriented. They were supported by lower middle classes, especially farmers. Farmers were big fans of the Jeffersonians. They were pro-French when it came to foreign affairs because of France's help during the American Revolution. And also because of the French Revolution, look to the American Declaration of Independence. And they also favored a strict interpretation of the Constitution. So unless the Constitution said you can do something, you can't, they would argue. Now, both parties developed out of two reasons. They came about because of two reasons. This could be a short answer. Make sure you can explain why they developed. Hamilton's financial plan and the French Revolution. The Supreme Court strengthened the power of the federal government during this time, and it was often done at the expense of state government. So a couple core cases you should be familiar with. We have Marbury versus Madison from 1803. This established the principle of judicial review, the ability of the Supreme Court on the national level to declare laws unconstitutional. And this will be extended to state laws in a later court case, Fletcher versus Peck. In McCullough v. Maryland, this upheld the constitutionality of the Second Bank of the United States, and this gave the federal government more power over states. States could not tax a federal agency that they did not like. And the third court case you should know is Gibbons versus Ogden. This dealt with boats on the Hudson River. And what the Supreme Court said is that Congress, not states, can control interstate commerce. Interstate means to or more. I have an article on my webpage I'll link to in the description on why we know that Chris Brown and Pimple did not take AP US history. Check it out. It relates to this case. Okay, let's jump on over to the Democrats and Whigs. They really developed in the 1820s and 1830s. The Democrats were led by Andrew Jackson. He was seen as the common man. And kind of continuing with the Jeffersonians, they were against the bus and Henry Clay's American system. I have a, dis a video for the American system in the description. Check it out, I got a bunch of videos that relates to this. His American system focused on the Bank of the United States, internal improvements, and tariffs. Now on the other end, we have the Whigs, led by my boy Henry Clay, there's the young Henry Clay. They developed because they were anti-Andrew Jackson. They favored a stronger federal government, internal improvements, tariffs, and the boss or the Bank of the United States. So this is really kind of almost a continuation, at least of the ideas of the Federalist Party. Now, regional political and economic loyalties overshadowed national concerns. What does that mean? Well, people tended to be more loyal to the region than they were the nation. 
And we see this in the nullification crisis of the 1830s, where South Carolina, led by Dracula, I mean, John C. Calhoun, um, really, he and other states opposed the tariffs of 1828 and 1832, which were really high. And, and South Carolina takes it a step further and even nullified those tariffs. And they told Andrew Jackson, its president, hey, you try to collect these tariffs by force or collect them at all, we will secede. So really, the country is on the break of the Civil War during the nullification crisis. And during the same time, we have Webster's, Daniel Webster, his second reply to Hayne, this was in the Senate, this really demonstrated that Webster wanted to promote nationalism over sectionalism. So we see the emergence of some leaders like a Henry Clay, like a Daniel Webster, who are saying, hey, America is more important than your region. I have videos for these as well in the description. Okay, 4.1 Roman numeral two, while Americans embraced a new national culture, various groups developed distinctive cultures of their own. We're going to focus on the Second Great Awakening. They, this time period, sought to inspire humans to achieve perfection. So we have this dude, Charles G. Finney, Charles Grandison Finney. He gave these massive sermons to convert individuals. So he's really bringing people back to religion, and and he's going to be very influential in New York, especially along towns along in towns along the Erie Canal. Utopian societies begin to develop, and these are social experiments that hope to achieve perfection in communities. We have communities like Oneida, Brook Farm, etc., in which these, these people really live together, and they're pretty self-sufficient, and they're trying to achieve perfection in these communities. Now, the big thing to know about the Second Great Awakening is it inspires other reform movements. Things like temperance and abolition and education, and we'll talk about more of those in just a couple minutes. Now, let's jump over to the emergence of a new national culture. Well, this was a combination of European and local culture and American culture as well. There's new American art, literature, and architectural ideas that emerged. We see John James Audubon, who was this great outdoorsman and made significant contributions to the study of birds. Prince of Birds, he was discovering species left and right, and really his books became very, very popular. And the Hudson River School, they focused on landscape paintings, and they believed nature was a great source of wisdom and inspiration. So if you ever see a painting, here's an example of the Hudson River School painting. If you ever see a painting of outdoors or anything with the environment, chances are it's going to be the Hudson River School. I always think river, outdoors, Hudson River School. There you go. Literature, art, philosophy, and architecture reflected a belief in human perfectibility. And we see this evident in the transcendentalism movement of the 1830s. This really encouraged individuals to have communication with both God and nature. Now, two famous writers you should be familiar with. is One is Ralph Waldo Emerson. He wrote Self-Reliance. And he believed that individuals should follow their own self-interest. And the other dude is Henry David Thoreau. And he wrote two influential books, Walden and Civil Disobedience. Now, in Walden, he wrote about his experiences of living in nature for two, for two years at Walden Pond. And Civil Disobedience, we know, will go on to influence people like Gandhi and Martin Luther King during the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 1960s. Now, enslaved African Americans created communities and they sought to protect their family structures and dignity. And they did so by developing surrogate families or kind of adopted families when they were split up through the slave trade. When families were separated, others would look after family members. So there were really these elaborate systems set up to help deal with the horrific loss of family members due to the slave trade. And slave music was also developed and this was used to help pass the time while working. And this played an instrumental part of religious services that slaves were part of as well. All right, 4.1 Roman numeral three, increasing number of Americans, numbers of Americans, many inspired by new religious and intellectual movements, worked primarily outside of government institutions to advance their ideals. So what were some organizations that attempted to improve society and individual behavior? Well, the American Temperance Society, which I mentioned briefly earlier, this was co-founded by this dude, Lyman Beecher, who happened to be the father of Harriet Beecher Stowe. What did Harriet Beecher Stowe write? You know this, come on, very influential book. That's right, Uncle Tom's Cabin. By the way, she was from Cincinnati. And this really created thousands of chapters throughout the United States, the American Temperance Society. And you had thousands and thousands of people who committed to the temperance movement to try to eliminate alcohol. And this was very closely aligned with the abolitionist movement as well. 
Now, Dorothy Dix, here's Dorothy. She sought to improve treatment for the mentally ill and really made a big difference in the treatment for this group of people. You have Horace Mann, here he is. He's known as the father of education. I don't know about you, he looks like a teacher to me. And we had Shakers as well, this religious group that practiced celibacy and they believed in sexual equality. So they were really advanced for their time when it came to gender equality for men and women. Abolitionists and anti-slavery movements we'll talk about now. They achieved much of their success in the North, and many Northern states gradually emancipated their slaves. And by the early to mid-1800s, slavery was essentially not existent in the North. And there was a cre an increasing number of free African Americans in the North and in the South as well. And eventually, many states in the South made it illegal for slave owners to manumit or free their slaves. We see it in places like Virginia in particular after 1831. Now, anti-slavery in the South was not very successful in changing the status of many slaves initially. Um, we see in the House of Representatives on national level, the gag order, which was instituted by the South, this prohibited the introduction of abolitionist bills in the House of Representatives. So if a Northerner who was in the House wanted to ban slavery and introduce a bill, that would not even be allowed to be discussed in the House of Representatives. This is eventually overturned by a very prominent House of Representative member, John Quincy Adams. Unsuccessful rebellions in the South. Now in the South, many slaves tried to change their status by rebellion, by rebellion but unfortunately for them, they were very unsuccessful. Denmark Vesey in 1820 planned the largest ever slave rebellion. This never materialized. He and his followers were hanged, and this led to more strict slave laws. In 1831, we have Nat Turner's Rebellion, which was a rebellion in Virginia, freed... Um, that freed many slaves and killed whites on plantations, and hundreds of blacks were killed in retaliation. Not only those that were involved in the rebellion, but just random blacks as well. And again, just like Denmark, the Denmark VC planned rebellion, slave laws become stricter. Every time there's a slave rebellion, there will be harsher slave laws. Now, in 1831, Nat Turner's rebellion coincided at the same time with the publication of William Lloyd Garrison's weekly newspaper, The Liberator. And here is Garrison. And this called for the immediate and uncompensated end to slavery. So he was an outspoken critic of slavery, one of the harshest ones at the time. The women's rights movement often was connected to the abolitionist movement, and they hoped to achieve greater equality. And you could see this at the Seneca Falls Convention in New York in 1848. This was a women's rights convention in which people like Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia Mott joined together to propose more rights for women. It was even attended and supported by very well-known men such as Frederick Douglass, the former slave who was a great orator and outspoken advocate for women's rights. Okay, let's go over some test tips for multiple choice and short answer. Be able to identify and explain some core cases that increase the power of the federal government, characteristics of political parties, and organizations and individuals that sought to improve society as well as ways that slaves resisted their conditions. For essay questions, be able to describe issues that led to the creation of political parties and the impact of the Second Great Awakening on American society as well. All right, guys, thank you very much for watching. I do appreciate it. Look forward to seeing you right back here for Key Concept 4.2 where we'll get into more detail on my boy, Henry Clay. If you have any questions or comments, leave them in the section below. I thank you for watching and have a good day.